welcome to part one of the ECG Axis tutorial. Uh, my name is Adam Thompson. I'm a paramedic and uh, EMS instructor out of Southwest Florida. This ECG Axis tutorial has, has come along because I, I meet a lot of people and teach EKGs to a lot of people and they, they have a lot of questions about this EKG Axis stuff because I'm always uh, sort of using it to, to interpret EKGs and I explain how the axis is sort of deviated and they're like, well, what does that mean? And uh, Tom Boothelay from EMS12lead.com actually has a great EKG axis tutorial on his website. So I figured I would sort of hijack his uh, teaching style and some of his images and, and give the same thing but in, in video format and put it on here, you know, so my students can go on and check it out. And so anybody on YouTube can uh, enjoy it. I'm also the editor for the Paramedicine 101 blog, uh, and if you go on paramedicine101.com, you'll see we have all kinds of pre-hospital and emergency medicine education, and the Paramedicine 101 Facebook site, I think, uh, has a lot of good, interesting stuff, and including EKG cases pretty much weekly. So this is, this is Tom Boothelay's six-step method for interpreting 12 EKGs. I don't know where he came up with it, but I'm not going to take credit for it. So... Uh, uh, I'm going to give him his credit, and, and this is his six-step method. And you'll see that step two is axis determination. So the first thing we're going to do is, is determine rate and rhythm. Then axis determination is, is, is up there. It's kind of important. Then, of course, intervals, morphology. We're going to look for mimics, which uh, there will be another video about. And ischemia, injury, and infarct. That's all your STEMI stuff. Take a look at this 12 EDKG. It's from a 45-year-old male who is experiencing chest pain. Now, given what you know now about EKG interpretation, I want you to think uh, about what you would do for this patient based on this 12 lead alone. What sort of actions would you take? And based on this EKG, you know, sort of what type of treatment you would provide? Well, you know, chest pain, we're probably going to follow some sort of chest pain protocol anyhow and, and use aspirin and nitrates if indicated. But if Many of you learned EKGs the way I learned. The first thing you learn is to make sure your leads are on appropriately, right? So you look at lead one, and lead one should have a QRS complex that's mostly positive, and AVR should have a QRS complex that's mostly negative. But here we see that that is not true. And in fact, the limb leads are misplaced uh, on this patient. You have just determined that the axis is deviated based upon looking at the 12 lead EKG and making sure that the QRS complex is deflected in a certain direction. So you've probably been doing it for a long time and may have never even realized that that is some sort of axis deviation. This here is a list uh, that I've kind of put together from a bunch of different uh, resources and it includes the most common causes of axis deviation and the different types. So you have, you t when, when you talk about EKG axis, you have really two main types. You have your frontal plane, and your precordial axis. Frontal plane axis is, is taken from all your limb leads. So leads one, two, and three, AVR, AVL, and AVF. Uh, using those will give you your frontal plane axis. ERAD, that's uh, extreme right axis deviation. Sometimes that's called no man's land because that is the worst type of axis deviation to have. And basically, the, there's only a few things that can cause that. In fact, if you're if your leads are on appropriately, and that would be a ventricular arrhythmia, and a paced rhythm would be the most common causes. Also, very uncommon, dextrocardia, which is when your, your heart's kind of transpositioned, and electrolyte derangement. Right axis deviation from 90 to 180 degrees, and if you don't know what that means, you're going to learn it in this tutorial, so you're in the right place anyhow. And all these different causes, left posterior fascicular block, I'll explain that, right ventricular hypertrophy, right bundle branch block, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, uh, ventricular arrhythmias, dextrocardia again, and sometimes it's just a normal variant if you can rule all these things out. Uh, pathological left axis deviation is from negative 30 to negative 90 degrees, and maybe you've noticed we haven't covered from 0 to negative 30 degrees or from, in fact, uh, a 90 to negative 30 degrees because that would be normal or considered normal. And there's a little caveat to that that I'll talk about later. But these are all the common causes of uh, pathological left axis deviation, most common being left anterior fascicular block, left bundle branch block, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome again, left ventricular hypertrophy, hyperkalemia, Q waves from an MI, 
and pregnancy. Okay, and then you have your precordial axis, your precordial axis, and that comes from leads V1 through V6, and the causes of different axis transitions uh, I'm going to talk about later on. So I don't want to get too much into this list here, but I just want you to get an idea that it's sort of important. To, if you want to be good at EKG interpretation, you must learn how to identify the EKG axis and know what normal is and know what causes abnormal variances. So this is where we get our EKG axis from, is our conduction system, right? Uh, we know that this right here is your SA node, your sinoatrial node, SA node, and that's our, our normal physiologic pacemaker. That's where we get our impulse of life. It hopefully uh, out, sends out a signal from 60 to 100 times a minute for our entire life, and, it, and that sends conduction down here. Okay, these are intranodal pathways. You go across Bachman's bundle to the left atrium, and eventually your AV node where you pause and, and you hopefully get a good pause there, uh, allowing your ventricles to fill. And then your ventricle, ventricular depolarization will take over uh, AV junction and bundle branches and so on and so forth. So that's where you get your EKG axis from. And what we're going to talk about mainly, what we're going to focus on here is ventricular depolarization. When we talk about the EKG axis, we're talking about the QRS axis. And our QRS complex comes from ventricular depolarization. Okay, so from this image that we were just talking about, I, we're only going to focus on the ventricles for this discussion. So what's normal? What is normal? Don't worry if you don't understand what this image is, because I'm going to explain what it is and where it comes from. But the normal QRS axis is at about 60 degrees, okay? And that can, that can vary anywhere sort of in this quadrant here from 0 to 90 degrees. And even if it deviates a little bit to the left, this is left as you go this way, that's left. Uh, even if it deviates a little bit to the left up to negative 30 degrees, um, that can be a normal variant as well. So this can all be physiologically normal. I want to talk a little bit about Willem Einthoven. Willem Einthoven. And he is actually the guy that we should all thank for discovering the EKG. He won the Nobel Prize in physiology, uh, ph physiology or medicine in 1924 uh, for inventing the string galvanometer, which was the first EKG. And if you notice the picture here, you see his, his hands here and, and his foot are all immersed in water. And th th that right there gave him leads one two, and three, which we still call the Limleys to this day. Okay, so Willem Einthoven, he's kind of an important dude because he's going to be the guy that discovered something we're going to talk about now, the Einthoven's Triangle. And Einthoven's Triangle is considered a equilateral triangle. Equilateral. Now look at that picture, and, and this is where we get Einthoven's Triangle. This is lead one, this is lead two, and this is lead three. That's how we get Einthoven's Triangle right there. And if you look at it, you know, any, if you know anything about geometry, that is not equilateral, right? That is not equilateral at all. An equilateral triangle is more like something like that. It's uh, equal on all sides. But I'm going to explain, using Einthoven's Law right here, how it's equilateral. And you don't have to memorize any of this. It's just an in intuition thing. I, you need to understand where it comes from. So it kind of makes sense and sits with you a little bit, okay? So I'm not going to dive too much into this. I just want to give a quick example of what Einthoven's Law is. Einthoven's law states if you take lead 1, you add that to negative lead 2. So whatever lead 2 is, you need, you need to change its symbol. If it's positive, you make it negative. If it's negative, make it positive. And then add that to lead 3, and that will always equal 0. And that kind of creates our equilateral triangle. And here, let's explain what that formula means. Here, if you look at this, uh, this EKG example that I've taken from Tom Boothley's blog, ems12lead.com, again, another plug for him, uh, lead 1 in this EKG, the R wave is about 7.5 millimeters tall. Don't worry about you know squinting and counting it out. I promise you it's 7.5 millimeters tall. And the S wave is about 2.5 millimeters deep. So since the S wave is negative, uh, you're going to take that from the R wave height. And you end up with about 5 millimeters. So 7.5 minus 2.5 equals 5, right? So that's about 5 millimeters. You're going to do the same thing with lead 2. It's essentially a monophasic QS wave, meaning it's all negative at about negative 10 millimeters. All right, same thing with lead 3. Lead 3 uh, has an R wave that's about 1 millimeter high. I know it's hard to see, but there's a little R wave in there. It's about 1 millimeter. And the S wave is about 16 millimeters deep. About 16 millimeters there. So 
1 minus 16 gives us negative 15 millimeters. You didn't know you were going to get a quick little elementary math lesson with this, did you? So you just plug those numbers into this law we already talked about, this formula. So 5 from lead 1. Uh, since it was negative 10 in lead 2, and we know that we have to change the symbol, you just add 10. And then since uh, lead 3 ended up being negative 15, we're going to put that right here at negative minus 15. And if you add that up, 5 plus 10 is 15, minus 15 equals 0. Any EEKG you look at, 12 EDKG you look at, if the leads are on appropriately, should be able to do this. And it will. And because of that, because every lead is sort of dependent on the other equally, it gives us that equilateral Einthoven's triangle. So this becomes this electrically. Okay? So that, this is how you need to picture the leads looking at the heart. All right, and it, it kind of gives you a better idea of where our angles come from as we get into the hexaxial reference diagram. That's pretty much it for this lesson one. I don't want to get too much into it and confuse you too much, so go back through it if you don't understand completely. Uh, this image specifically, uh, Einthoven's triangle and how Einthoven discovered this triangle is super important um, in, in, in the limb leads and how we use them is going is to come up real soon here in the next part of the axis determination tutorial.